Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around, we're doing a couple of what I call Sunday afternoon films. Back in the day when television was your only option to watch things and it was a horrible and benighted time, on Sunday afternoons, a certain kind of movie would be shown, particularly here in Australia on Channel 9, which tended to be English war films of the 1950s. They did other things as well. You'd occasionally get stuff like Run for the Sun, which I like a lot, or... The Naked Jungle, but there was a big strike, particularly around Anzac Day, which is the day commemorating an unsuccessful invasion of Turkey. But you get a lot of war films, and these two are two that are kind of good. One's from 58, one's from 1960, and they've each got some interesting subtexts when seen from a 21st century view. So let's get started with 1960's Sink the Bismarck. A movie directed by Lewis Gilbert, who later went on to direct You Only Live Twice, which is kind of cool. You Only Live Twice was kind of cool for a number of reasons, one of which was that Roald Dahl did the script. But Sink the Bismarck is exactly what's on the title. It's like Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. You know the plot from the title. And this one's got a pretty good cast of 50s English actors. You've got Kenneth Moore playing the head of operations in a bunker. 100 feet below Westminster in London. You've got Carl Muna playing the Captain of the Bismarck, and you've got Dana Winter playing the female officer who is the assistant to Kenneth Moore's character. So the movie takes place in early 1939, two and a half years before America got its finger out and joined the war, and the Nazis' most powerful battleship, the Bismarck, is launched. Now, we've seen newsreel footage of this with a certain short guy with a toothbrush moustache launching the ship. So in early 1941, the Bismarck and another ship, the Prince Eugen, head out of the Baltic Sea into the North Atlantic to begin hunting battleships and also material ships heading from North America to Europe and to the UK in particular. Captain Shepard, the character played by Kenneth Moore, has to work out which one of five different passages the Bismarck is going to take to get to the sea lanes of the North Atlantic. The British Navy moves a whole bunch of warships from further south all across the west coast of Europe to check out these sea lanes and see if they can find the Bismarck. Radar is still very early in its development and is very unreliable, so they use aircraft carriers with spotted planes and eventually they spot the Bismarck. So in the first encounter, the Bismarck totally destroys the hood and the Prince of Wales gets very heavily damaged as well. Desperate plans are made to sink the Bismarck before it can do any more damage. This movie is really interesting in its casting because the captain of the Prince of Wales is played by an actor called Esmond Knight who was Llewellyn in the version of Henry V that Laurence Olivier did. He was also a gunnery officer on the real-life Prince of Wales during the encounter with the Bismarck and he lost his vision in both eyes temporarily one eye was uh worked on and he got vision back in that eye but the other one was totally destroyed by an encounter with the real life bismarck one of the other interesting additions is edward r murrow the american broadcaster reprises his role as himself reporting on the events of the bismarck encounters for a radio audience in the united states so that was kind of interesting bringing him in Though he does tend to kind of stick out a bit and doesn't play any other part in the narrative. But you've got a lot of other familiar faces in this film. You've got Lawrence Naismith playing the first Sea Lord. And they don't have anything like Bismarck's firepower. She could stand off and sink every ship in a convoy without ever coming under fire. He was in any number of British films. He was in Jason and the Argonauts. He was also in Valley of Gwangi, which I have a great fondness for. You've got Morris Denham turning up in there as well. Victor Madden and Graeme Stark, a couple of other English character directors. You even get some people who weren't quite famous at this stage turning up as well. People like David Hemmings turns up in a minor speaking role. Edward Judd turns up as the navigating officer aboard the Prince of Wales. And we get other actors like Michael Horde and a whole bunch of actors were brought in just for short scenes, including other people like Sidney Taffler. A whole bunch of British actors of the time were just brought in for a couple of days to do a couple of scenes. And then, you know, get the hell out and, and go back to the pubs and club. So the history is almost accurate on the Bismarck encounters. There was some stuff they couldn't talk about. Part of the intelligence that was received that helped them 
find and destroy the Bismarck was actually received from the code breakers at Bletchley Park. And Captain Shepard, the character played by Kenneth Moore, is an interesting character. He lost his wife in the Blitz, and his son is serving aboard the Ark Royal. And his son goes missing. He was in a um, torpedo plane. And the plane went down, and his son was missing for, for some of the film. He is found eventually. But you've got this character who personifies that stiff upper lip cliche of English soldiers and sailors and airmen. Actually, I think it helps to talk about these things, don't you, sir? No, I don't. As a matter of fact, I don't think it helps at all. Getting emotional about things is a peacetime luxury. Wartime is much too painful. And the movie breaks that in an interesting way. The stiff upper lip and Shepard's attitude to adversity and personal versus professional life gets a bit of a kick in the head in this one and there's an interesting encounter or not quite encounter between him and the ran officer played by dana winter where she sees him being vulnerable but doesn't talk about it So it's a kind of interesting approach that's taken to this where because at first they kind of follow the stiff upper lip thing but then the facade cracks and it becomes a little more interesting and his character becomes a bit more human after being a total bastard for the first two thirds of the film. And I like that. And they don't buy into that mythology about British military forces. The special effects work is pretty good. The model work is as good as you're going to get at the time. And because they filmed it in black and white cinemascope, the models pass a lot better than models passed in colour movies of the time, where they're pretty obviously models in the fact that they're in colour and the colour grading and the colour backgrounds aren't quite on point. A lot of movies of the time that covered naval warfare of various kinds didn't do it as well as Sink the Bismarck. I think it's a nice, honest war film of its time. It gives us a very large cast. It talks about strategy in a really interesting way. Things like a lack of radar and fog, and not necessarily just the fog of war, but plain old fog, impeded efforts to find these ships. And the way that, the way that England's limited resources meant that one of the troop carriers with 20,000 men on it was left vulnerable to German attack while the Bismarck was busy being sunk by the warships that were supposed to protect that troop carrier. So there are tough decisions that were being made. And the movie doesn't understate them. They do talk about them and the consequences of moving resources around the theatre of war in a really interesting way. Funny thing about Sink the Bismarck is I picked up a copy of it for a dollar at a charity store or maybe a flea market i forget which it was a while back but there it is there one dollar for the movie i think it's well worth more than a dollar it's a solid little war film and again it's one of those sunday afternoon films that i liked a lot didn't realize i already had a copy because i didn't look at my database before i got the one dollar copy this one cost me three dollars whereas the other one cost me one dollar but I'll find a home for my extra copy of Sink the Bismarck because I think it's a nice, honest World War II film which doesn't glorify war one tiny bit. Uh, I didn't mention, too, the other side of things, the Admiral aboard the Bismarck, who is a kind of very, very much an Adolf Hitler stan, who is very much at odds with Karl Müller's captain who is, lives in the real world and doesn't live in the world of ideology. So there's a split down the line between the Admiral and the Captain, where the Admiral almost creams himself every time Hitler sends him a message. Meanwhile, the Captain has to deal with damage to the ship and resources and fuel and all those real-world problems that anybody in charge of any large effort has to deal with. So they don't necessarily go to the good German trope, but they do illustrate the fact that 
there was disagreement between the people doing the actual work and the people who were into the glory of what they were doing. And I think that that nuance makes the movie a bit more interesting as well. But uh, Sink the Bismarck, worth checking out, whichever copy you get. So that then brings me to the second of the films that I'm going to talk about today. One of the great adventure films about World War II, directed by J. Lee Thompson, it's from 1958, stars John Mills, Harry Andrews, Anthony Quayle and Sylvia Sims, Ice Cold in Alex. Truly a great film. And Luna's shadow, of course, as she inevitably does in these videos. You want to come and have your picture taken? Let's see if I can progress with her there. Uh, the story's fairly simple. A group of people are leaving Tobruk, heading to Alexandria because the Germans in North Africa have besieged Tobruk. And two nurses are left behind by accident after the uh, troop ship taking all the other nurses away from the North African campaign heads out of Tobruk. And an alcoholic soldier called Captain Anse who has been through hell in five different campaigns during the war, played by Johnny Mills. A non-commissioned officer, Tom Pugh, played by Harry Andrews, and the two nurses head off in an ambulance to try to drive to Alexandria, going around the front of the war in order to avoid the Germans. On the way, they pick up a South African officer, Captain Van der Poel, Van der Poel. played by Anthony Quayle, and they head through some very dangerous territory in order to try to get to Alexandria. Now the fact that Anson is self-medicating with alcohol, he's an alcoholic, and Pew is pretty much looking after him, the way a lot of non-commissioned officers did their officers at the time. It makes for an interesting dynamic between them. Van der Poel, Van der Poel. and I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say, isn't quite what he says he is. And the, and the nurses head across the desert, They've got to find their way through a minefield. They encounter German patrols as well who want to make sure that they're an ambulance and they're not carrying soldiers or weapons because ambulances were, for the most part, respected as neutral vehicles during these sort of campaigns. They have mechanical problems. They have fuel problems. They encounter every possible hassle, the heat, and they also have to detour through the Katara Depression which is basically a salt crust over a saline swamp. So they have to make a way across that, which then leads them to problems with things like quicksand. Means that, uh, you know, things are pretty tough for the group. And then finally they have a final barrier, an enormous sand dune that the ambulance can't get up by any normal means. This is a fantastic small scale part of World War II movie. It works because of the actors. John Mills playing against type as a kind of worn out man who is probably suffering from what we now call PTSD. He, he's got alcohol problems. He makes decisions rashly and there are consequences to some of those decisions until he gets his shit together basically and says, I'm not drinking any more of the alcohol we've got on board until I can have a nice ice cold beer in his favourite bar in Alexandria, which is where the title comes from, Ice Cold in Alex. So John Mills is really good in this one, and again, playing against type because he, he tended to not play weak characters in, in movies at the time. Harry Andrews in real life had a really interesting World War II. He was commissioned into the Royal West Kent Regiment, was transferred to the Royal Artillery, and served in Europe during the D-Day landings as well, and on the advance into Germany. He got mentioned in dispatches for gallant and distinguished service in Northwest Europe and became a major before he was demobbed in 1946. So he had good credibility as a NCO in the movie and Harry Andrews does a fantastic job of this. All of this stuff, and this is another reason why homophobes are stupid. Harry Andrews was a closeted gay man while he achieved all those things during the war. Anthony Quayle also served really well during the war. He was a member of the Special Operations Executive, the mob that Ian Fleming ran, and he did a lot of liaison with the Eastern European partisans who were fighting against the Germans as well. He actually went over there and liaised with them, so all of these guys had nothing to prove as human beings. And their war service and their gritty toughness really shows in this. Sylvia Sims was 
by her own admission out of her depth, she's suddenly in the Libyan desert, and they did film a lot of it on, in, on location. She's in the Libyan desert and without her husband. She's on location with the, all these people. They're keeping the flies off the actors by putting DDT all over them. And she was really looked after by her other actors because this was her first time shooting a film outside of England. And she really had a tight lock on the kind of characters she was supposed to play. Her nurse, Diana, is an officer. And she's, of course, looked after a whole bunch of wounded soldiers over the previous months and years. And so Sylvia Sims does a good job of playing her toughness. The things that challenge this small group of people fray everybody around the edges. They all get exhausted and, and emotionally torn to bits by the adversity that they meet. This is a fantastic war film. Again, it's in black and white widescreen, and I like it a lot for that. The way the action scenes are done, uh, J. Lee Thompson, really fine action director, ended his career doing fairly third-rate Charles Bronson action flicks, but made a number of good films, and this is definitely one of them. It's one of my favourite movies about World War II because it's about a small group of people who essentially are fighting against an environment rather than fighting necessarily against the enemy. They have to get from A to B, and that's the plot. The rest of the subplots are, are really interesting. They, they have two encounters with German patrols, which go in interesting directions, and they bond together as a group in a way that's not quite like I've seen in other films. Inevitably, of course, they get to Alexandria and get into that bar, and the bartender pours some four bottles of Carlsberg, which was used in a television commercial, I believe, in England, those scenes. And I don't think a glass of beer was ever filmed as deliciously as the beers in Ice Cold in Alex at the End. And as Sylvia Sims said, the only person who could scull a whole one of those beers in one go was John Mills. Harry Andrews couldn't do it. Anthony Quayle couldn't do it, Sylvia Sims couldn't do it, but John Mills guts down that whole beer in one shot. And, and being an Australian, that's something we put a lot of credence in. Anyone who can scull a beer is okay with us. I can do it too, by the way. Let me know if you want me to scull a beer on the channel. I'm not an alcoholic, but I do like a beer now and then. But I'm willing to scull a beer if I get a few more people joining up at patreon.com slash paleocinema explicitly saying when they do that they want to see me scull a whole beer on screen in one of my videos. If you don't, that's okay. Still doing well with the Patreons, who are wonderful people. But just let me know if you do. So just to summarise these two movies, one's on a very big scale with a lot of participants and very large machinery. But Sink the Bismarck isn't on the intimate scale necessarily that Ice Cold and Alex is. But Ice Cold and Alex gives us a character-based piece set in the deserts of North Africa, filmed in the deserts of North Africa, and it has a wonderfulness about it, and a grittiness, and a toughness, and an interesting climax, which makes it a, a movie that I find easy to love. So anyway, that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. Again, if you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment. You can also, I've done the Patreon things, so I won't do that again. Next time around, I've got a couple of janky old 1950s science fiction movies for Science Fiction Saturday, which I'm looking forward to doing. But in the meantime, look after yourselves. Watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Maybe dip back into some World War II movies that don't glorify war and try to, within the limitations of censorship at the time, show what a mongrel business it is to be part of a war. And I'll catch you next time.